Welcome to the Recovery 2.0 conference. I'm your host, Tommy Rosen, and I am so pleased to be speaking today with Ricky Tran. Ricky is the founder of Krama Yoga Center, Castle Hills Yoga, Standard Yoga Training Company, Breakfast Yoga Club, and is widely recognized as an inspirational leader and accomplished yoga practitioner. Coming from a background of addiction, Ricky found yoga as a way to heal, transform, and awaken his body, mind, and heart to true freedom. His lectures and workshops on external and internal yoga illuminate perspectives on postures, breath, mind, philosophy, and yogic lifestyle. His celebrated teachings of Sanskrit and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are both accessible and powerful. At a conference recently, I saw Ricky present a lecture on the Yoga Sutras and recovery, and it really blew me away. I called him, and here we are. Ricky, thank you for lending your wisdom, your presence, and your voice to the Recovery 2.0 conference. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Ricky, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing with our viewers a little bit about your, your path with regards to yoga. How did you come to yoga? Uh, was it love at first sight? What was your experience in your first years of study? No, it wasn't love at first sight. Um, the <laughs> first time I found yoga was uh, in college. It was, I was probably a junior, um, and I just, wa I just wanted to try a yoga class. I don't remember what, what drew me in, but um, I took a yoga class. Um, it was at the college inn. It was a hotel or a dorm, and uh, I remember it being not satisfying at that time. I was young, I had a lot of energy, and I was into working out and, and playing sports and just being real active. And um, I remember, I don't remember what we did during class, but I remember what we did at the end of class, Shavasana. I don't remember the name, I didn't remember what it was called. I just remembered laying down and the teacher tucking me into bed. I had a blanket up to, up to my, my neck and, and, and I was cocooned. And you know something was put over my eyes, and I was just like, "What? What's going on?" And then you know she was guiding us through relaxation or whatever, and I was not relaxed. I was thinking about this and that and the other, and couldn't wait to get out of there. And that was it. And I didn't look back. I didn't want to do yoga after that. Yes. Um, I continued doing whatever I did otherwise. Yes. Um, that was probably my junior year, I guess, my junior year, and. Um, What's that? Junior year, 2002, 2001, I think 2001. Then um, I graduated in 2002 and uh, didn't find yoga again until about 2005. So I had a few years where I was trying to find myself after college, you know, not sure what, what to do. You know, I, I jumped around from job to job. Not exactly sure. I, I, I had a degree in business, entrepreneurship, and strategic management and real estate. Mm. Um, I wanted to do something in those fields, but I, I really wanted to open a business. But without experience, they're not going to give you a loan. You know, without collateral, they're not going to give you a loan. And so I was sort of like in this catch-22 in my life. Yes. So I ended up um, uh, partying a lot. <laughs> I didn't get much done during the day. I, you know, sent out my resume. I did the resume game and all that, and without any bites, if there's nothing to do, I was bored. So I went out at night and partied and did that, you know, that thing. And then um, again the next day, send out resumes, make phone calls, go to Monster.com, hmm. Jobs.com. I, I don't even know if those sites are still around, but they, maybe they are. But um, and um, so ended up deciding I wanted to move away to, to Austin. To try to find myself, I lived in Dallas. I lived in Dallas at the time. I'm in Dallas now, and I was actually trying to run away from the party scene. I was trying to run away from my habits, if mm. you will, just uh, you know, um, partying too hard. <laughs> sure. So, and uh, when I got to Austin, I ended up like my problems followed me. I, I did the same things in a different city. And, I, and it got pretty bad, so I decided, hey, I need to go back to my base, my roots, um, where my, my network is, you know, people I know in Dallas, and I, I think I, I thought I had better chances of finding my way. So I came back to Dallas, and then um, 
in poor health, broke, um, you know, just kind of on the on the on the verge of, of collapse. And um, I decided to 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 do something different. And it was yoga again this time. It was like if I continue to do the things I've been doing, I'm going to continue to get the things I've been getting. I remember my mentors taught me that when I was 19. I yes. was 24 at this time, 25, 26 or something like that, mid 20s. And I remember like, if, and so I, I used that mantra. I didn't know it was a mantra at the time. I, I kept thinking it. So if you keep doing the things you've been doing, you're going to keep doing the things you've been doing. So as soon as I saw myself, you know, gravitating towards the gym, I was like, oh, that's what I used to do. So I'm going to try something different. So um, I tried yoga, yeah. and it was a it was a power yoga class. So it was physical, it was strenuous. It gave me the workout that I was wanting, and I didn't know anything about yoga. I was it was just a workout at the time, in my mind at least. And um, I was hooked. So the f first class in like hooked from the first class. Two, I wasn't hooked. the first class in '05. Yeah, the first class then because I left the class. My body was completely trembling. I was so sweaty, and my, I think there was like maybe two dry spots on my shirt. It was one on both sides near the bottom, <laughs> and um, and I walked out. My legs were trembling. My arms were trembling. I was like, I had no weights, and um, this is good. I think I, I and I sweated a lot, and I could smell the toxins. I could smell yeah. So um, and uh, you. Yeah. You know, there's some in the medical community says you don't sweat out toxins, but I can tell you I smelled something and it wasn't good. And I knew I was getting get, getting rid of whatever it was that wasn't good through mm -hmm. through this. You know, and now I know that it's breath, sweat, and other things too. But at any rate, um, I committed at that point. I was like, you know, I'm gonna try this for a year. I'm gonna really go for it. And it was a big commitment for me. One, I was broke, and two, it was twice the membership cost of the gym, twice mm -hmm. the cost of it. I could have joined the gym for about. 30 bucks a month and at the time it was like 60 bucks a month or something mm -hmm. and um, and uh, yeah and I didn't look back after that and um, from there the more I learned the more I wanted to know and it was just it's just been an amazing journey yes. ever since. Ricky my experience of seeing you speak I, I'm sincere when I say uh, you really blew my mind and, and I, I felt like you had a level of knowledge of, of yoga philosophy, um, a, a level of knowledge. I, when we went through some basic movements in, in that presentation with you together, I could see how open your body was and th that you moved with elegance and freedom. And so here was what I consider to be a very young man who had really made a lot of progress. And, and when I heard uh, a bit about your background that you had also come from addiction like I had come from uh, I started taking immediate interest in your path one of the things that's the most interest interesting about what I've come to understand about you is your love of the philosophical side of yoga that in your practice yes obviously very physical but it's 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 absolutely aligned with the ethical and with the the philosophical so I, I want to focus on that because I think that's super inspiring and I want I want to draw for people who are watching I want to draw some uh, you know the connection between recovery philosophy or, or, or how yoga philosophy can be helpful and how it dovetails with recovery philosophy so if you wouldn't mind I'd like to talk about um, the philosophical basis for yoga as is laid out in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras basically the Bible of yoga right. so at, at what point in your training did somebody introduce to you hey you know this this is a practice that goes beyond just the physical my first teacher um, was a or is a, a sort of a disciple of um, uh, Brian Kess, and she has some Bikram, so it's like a Bikram S. Brian Kess um, type practice. Very and physical. Yeah, her, and her name is Susie Curtis. She's um, in, in Addison, North Dallas, Texas. And uh, she, in, she weaved a lot of philosophy in her teachings as well, not necessarily uh, Yoga Sutras or Sanskrit or you know, the, the deeper stuff, but um, it, it, it was enough to get me curious. It was enough, enough for me to, to understand that there's a little more to this than the physical. 
It's about, you know, finding truth, our own truth or whatever, right? She, she would always say, be true to yourself, be true to yourself. And uh, she brought awareness to my ego and all this stuff. So that was my first sort of uh, experience, if you will. She planted the seeds and, they, and I had these experiences. Then I took a, um, a workshop, you know, I've heard of sutras and this and that. I even wore a shirt that said Yoga Sutras, Chitta Vritti Niroda, you know, yoga is the cessation of the modification. I used to wear that shirt and not knowing what it meant. And then I took a, a workshop with David Swenson, Ashtanga. It was my first um, Ashtanga immersion. And, uh, and he mentioned that yoga is the stilling, stillness of the mind. Yoga is Chitta Vritti Niroda. He mentioned the yoga sutras and, and it, 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 that was like a, a reminder it wasn't it, it I wasn't like oh sutras I gotta learn about the sutras now but it was sort of like you know people were hinting here and there I kept hearing there kept signs were popping up in my life yoga sutras yoga sutras yoga sutras and then um, at that workshop I met a guy named Ivan Smirnov he came in from um, St. Petersburg Russia and, uh, and he was like the most flexible, advanced, whatever, practitioner, if you will, physically there. And we hit it off and we talked a little bit. And he said, um, he goes, you need to go study with this uh, Ramaswamy, Srivatsa Ramaswamy. And I was like, I can't even pronounce that. Who is that? <laughs> I'm like, right, who is this? Like, who are these guys? Um, and I looked him up and it said they're Krishnamacharya's longest standing student outside the family, 33 years one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the guru. And I was like, wow, I really do, would li I, I would like to st study with this um, Srivatsa Ramaswamy. So I prepared myself. It took about a, a couple years of saving and pre preparation to go to LA, to LMU, to, to do his five and a half or six week program or five week program, seven week program, 45 days, something like that. And um, again, mind you, I was, I was broke. I had to save, I had to figure out a way to you know, keep my, my house and all the bills paid while I was out there spending extra money and studying with Ramaswamy. And he did a program um, called Raja Yoga Studies. Um, it's a two week, and it's two weeks of just yoga sutras. It was every syllable, every word exp explained, you know, um, and that, that, that summer, my mind was completely blown. I mean, when I came back home, my head was still spinning, and it spun for probably another year. But I did the things he told me to do. I kept studying. I kept practicing. I did meditation. I did. I did everything, and um, and then I went back and I did that. You know, it's been what now? It's been maybe seven, eight, nine years since I've been studying with him. I go back just about every summer. I host him at my studio. We keep in touch, and um, I've probably done the Yoga Sutra course with him. Um, I would say maybe uh, both there at LMU and here in Dallas at my studio, um, upward towards maybe eight, nine, ten times, um, and uh, it's that that guy. He says that a, a, a yoga practice, a yoga practice should have a guiding philosophy. Mm. Without the guiding philosophy, it, it, it's it might not be yoga. It might just be something else, right? Um, and so, and, and because, because I've studied the sutras and, and, and these seeds were planted in my mind, I felt like, I felt like it, it opened me up to a, a, a point of, of understanding that was beyond anything, really. It's, I feel like if it wasn't for my time with Ramaswamy, I wouldn't be as happy and, and as free as I am today. I mean, yes, I was happy and free to a degree, but this just kind of took me to the nth, to the highest, I feel. Yes. Um, Thank you. Can you, for people who are not aware, can you tell people what the Yoga Sutras are? Okay. The Yoga Sutras, um, the word sutra, sutra means, um, it's like the, word, the English word suture, a thread, you know, to stitch or whatever. But sutra, sutra is a, a thread. So it's a, what, a thread of what? A thread of, of logic, a thread of, of, of verses, a thread of, of shlokas, of, um, sayings, uh, aphorisms, concise sayings. Um, a, a sutra or a verse is much like a, a compressed file, a zip file, if you will. And um, it's written in Sanskrit, and it's generally, um, it's just nouns. There are no verbs. It's just, so it's as, as concise and, and as compressed as possible. 
And to my understanding that the sutras are not really meant for students to study. They're meant for teachers to use to teach the students because there has to be a key. Someone has to be able to decompress the zip files, unzip the zip files. If a student just goes and tries to read Yoga, Chitta, Vritta, Nirodha and tries to examine and understand it without understanding, first it's in a different language, it's non-spoken today, and secondly, there are a bunch of words missing to help you understand it. And so it's really designed for a teacher to expand and unzip and present to a student. One zip file can expand to a, like, a library of knowledge. And there's about 196 sutras, or 94, depending on the version you're looking at, broken down into four different chapters, the sutras. And it is basically the, the number one primary, honored by all traditions, um, like you said, Bible on yoga. Not that it's a religious thing, but it's sort of like, I like to look at the yoga sutras as being not only a spiritual book, but a science book. So um, it teaches you the science of yoga. If you know much about science, science is, is done in such a way that you can replicate a, 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 a result. Right? If you do this and you do this and you do it exactly the way they say you do it, then you should get this result. Yes. Likewise, with yoga, if you do the yoga postures a certain way, if you do the meditations a certain way, if you do this, then you'll get a result. And the result of yoga is a calm and peaceful mind. In other words, it's shanti. I think we talked about this at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, the presentation. The word shanti means peace, but it's not just peace or peace or, you know, it's a peace beyond understanding as T.S. Eliot would describe it. It's a peace beyond the understanding of your mind. Because if the mind is trying to understand something, it's not in a state of peace. It's chitta vritti is happening, right? You're trying to understand your, but whenever the mind isn't thinking anymore, it's in a state of peace. Yes. And that's exactly what yoga sutras teach you to do. How can I get my mind to the point where it's in an absolute state of peace? Mm -hmm. And in that place, you can experience true happiness, true freedom, and realize who you truly are if you're given the seed of knowledge to understand what you're experiencing. Otherwise, you go into meditation. It can be scary. It can be like, okay, I've experienced emptiness, but what does that mean? Right? So the sutras are sort of like the, uh, the road map that, teach, that takes you back to, um, to home. <laughs> it takes you home, really. Yes. Um, home of the soul, home of the heart. And, um, and, uh, and what my teacher says it's almost like um, the GPS, if you will. You know, now you can just type in the GPS and it'll take you home. The yoga sutras are like the ancient GPS that takes you home. Thank you so much. Can you, can you talk about where the yoga sutras begin, the first few sutras? Um, again, the sutras are a collection of 196, about 200 aphorisms or sutras um, broken down into four chapters. The first chapter being samadhi. Actually, the first chapter is the most, com the most I wouldn't say complex, but it's the most um, advanced chapter. Most books are written with the introduction and then basic and foundational knowledge, and then slowly they build and build and build, and at the end you've got like the most complex or the most advanced stuff towards the end of the chapters at the end of the book. Yoga Sutra were written opposite. They were written with the last, the goal in mind, right? Samadhi is actually the end of yoga, where the first chapter is actually Samadhi Pada, which is the chapter on the, the final stages of yoga. My teacher says that that chapter is actually written for the, um, the natural born yogi, someone who already has the capacity of reaching Samadhi or being in Samadhi. So um, the first four chapters, are act the first four sutras, um, contain all the information of the Yoga Sutras. It says those four zip files contain all the information that you ever would need for yoga. But if you don't have the capacity for Samadhi, you can't understand it. What's so Samadhi? So what is Samadhi? Samadhi uh, can be explained in many ways. There are different levels of Samadhi. Um, it's the goal of yoga, according to Patanjali. Um, Samadhi, okay. One interpretation of the word samadhi is a balanced mind, a balanced intellect. That's one interpretation. Some people say that... I just want to say that you could stop right there, um, and most people would, would, be, would wonder if they could ever get there. <laughs> right. It's, it's a, it can be a lofty goal. Yeah. It is huge. It's a big goal. Yep. It's like <laughs> samadhi, right? <laughs> But it's really not. 
It's really not. Um, and and I, I, I think one of my gifts is making it simple, you know, making it attainable. Um, but it does take hard work. Simple doesn't mean easy. Simple does not mean easy. Um, but samadhi can be an, a balanced mind or a balanced intellect. Samadhi can also mean um, the capacity to focus one's mind on one object and one object alone for an extended period of time. Samadhi can also mean forgetting oneself through focus. Forgetting oneself through focus. Um, some people say that samadhi means enlightenment. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if I agree with that, that samadhi is equivalent to enlightenment. Just because someone has the capacity to focus intently and forget themselves doesn't mean they're enlightened. Right? Just because someone has a balanced mind or intellect doesn't mean they're enlightened. So enlightenment is a process that happens through the practice of samadhi. Through the practice of, of intense concentration with knowledge. You know, you can concentrate, you know, you can, you can work real hard digging a ditch or you can work real hard, you know, right? Or work smart digging a ditch. Um, so you work hard to get to samadhi, but once you get to samadhi, samadhi is almost effortless. It's not really, it's both, my teacher says, it's both a skill and a state. It's both a skill and a state of being, right? So okay. you can be in samadhi or you can do samadhi. Like you can do, if you do samadhi, it becomes samyama. The word is samyama. So if you're doing the, the intense focus or concentration, then it becomes samyama. Sam means total or all. Total or all. And so yama means to control. So samyama means all your control is on one thing, one thing alone, mm. right? And it, but and that's also samadhi. Their words are interchangeable, right? Yes. So so quickly to interrupt you, uh, if if samadhi, as you've explained it, is the is the goal of yoga, um, and the first four sutras explain how to reach samadhi. Can we can we focus in on those sutras? Can can we focus yes. on the four sutras which lead into samadhi? Yes. Um, I wouldn't say that the first four sutras lead you into samadhi. Yes. Um, the first four sutras are this. The first sutra says Atta Yoga Anushasanam uh, now begins the exposition of yoga. More precisely, it says now begins the exposition of traditional or classical yoga. Hmm. Anu means to follow Anushasana means following the sastras or the texts. So here is yoga. Now begins the yoga practice or the yoga philosophy that follows the Veda. So in other words, he's saying that yoga came from the Vedas. You'll hear different people interpret this sutra differently. Now begins yoga, whatever. But really, it means now begins the exposition of traditional Anushasana, traditional yoga, yoga that follows tradition. Yes. Not like, not like new yoga, you know, some kind of hip-hop yoga or, you know, whatever kind of yoga is coming up that, that people are making, say, a pai yo, you know, type of yoga or like yoga, you know, hiking yoga, whatever. This is classical, traditional yoga. The second sutra says, um, right away he tells you what is yoga. Because the, the, uh, the question that arises from the first sutra, what is, you know, here's traditional yoga. So then the question is like, well, what is yoga? Right away he explains, yoga is chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the complete stoppage or the complete silence or the complete peacefulness of the mind. So right then and there he says, what is yoga? Okay, here's the goal. Yoga is complete peaceful. In other words, yoga's chitta vritti nirodha is samadhi. That, is, that second sutra is the explanation of what samadhi is. Samadhi is when there are absolutely no thoughts in your mind, including the thoughts of I am here now. You lose that thought even. The, there's no, there are no more eyes or me's or minds at that point because the ego is completely dissolved. Yeah. So there's only complete awareness of awareness. You're not like I am aware of my awareness. You are, you become awareness. Absorbed. Actually, you don't become because you already are awareness, right? Yes. So, so, so at that point in samadhi, there's no more me and you. There's just you. And you become the universe. You are the universe. You realize your connectivity. Your your you become. There's a, a feeling of harmony with everything. You become everything, right? I become you. It's not me and you. It's us. We are one now. There's this feeling of there's no more barriers. It's like 
It's the peacefulness of death. Mm. You can experience death mm. while you're still alive. The third sutra says, okay, so the question that arises is why would I want to have no thoughts? Why would I want chitta vritti naroda? That's just awkward. I've never, ever, ever, most people don't experience a moment that they even realize that they're having no thoughts because the thoughts come back immediately. And sometimes they come back in tidal waves. So like a tsunami of thoughts that come at us all the time. Um, so being thoughtless is like, for the average person, it's like, okay, I'm not going to have any thoughts. I'm not going to have any thoughts. I'm not going to have any thoughts. Well, that there is a thought, right? You're right. They can't do it. So, um, so then it's like, why would I want to do that? It's like, I don't know what I don't know. Why would I want to do that? So then the third sutra says, okay, well then, yoga chitta vritti nirodha tada drashtu svarupe vastanam. Tada drashtu svarupe vastanam. Then you become established in your own self. So by stealing your mind, you essentially can become established in your true self. Because we are always wearing masks. We're putting different masks on. We wake up in the morning, we put on a mask. We go to work, we put on a mask. We're, and we have all these different identities, right? Um, and then at some point, we might identify with this, causes pain. I don't like that, so I'll identify with this. Oh, that causes pain. I don't like that, so I'll identify with this. And we'll go, and we, we, we're trying to find... The mass that makes us most happy. We have lost ourselves. We've lost ourselves. You watch the media, you look around, you talk to people. Everyone has, is suffering from some kind of mistaken identity. Right? So, so the sutras, the second, third sutra says, Tada drashtu svarupe vas. Tada means then, like just like a magic trick. You know, it's the two, the two oldest professions in the world is prostitution and magic. And what does the magician say when he uncovers his magic trick? Tada! Ta uh, ta means then. Tada! Tada drashtu. Drashtu means the seer. Drashtu sva means self. Rupe means form. Tada drashtu sva rupe avasthanam. Vasthanam means become established in. So you become established in one's true form, which is beyond, which is actually formless. It's beyond this form, this body. It's beyond the, the, the makeup, the make believe mask that I put on my, my face every day, day in and day out. It's the, the essence of who I am, the true, my true being, my soul, my spirit, my atma, right? And um, it, it's realizing that I am a spiritual being having a human experience, hmm. right? It's having that experience. Not because someone told me or I read in a book or whatever, but because I went inside and I discovered it and uncovered it and had a revelation and it was revealed to me. And um, that's what yoga is all about. And then someone's like, well... I don't know if I want to do that. So then the fourth sutra says this, um, you know, the question that, that arises, well, what if I don't do that? What if I don't do that? Oh, well, if you don't do it, then vritti sarupya mita ratra. Vritti means the activities of the mind. Again, the mind starts to reel. Vritti sarupya. Sa means false self. Like sva means self, the, the true self. Sarupya means an, uh, like uh, um, a... Uh, a replica of oneself, but not the true self. In other words, the false self. Vritti sarupya mitaratra. Then you start to identify with the false self. Mm. Causes pain or doesn't cause pain. It sounds a little bit like the Matrix, where you can take the red pill or the blue pill. Totally. This is totally the Matrix. The Matrix is so right on with the yoga experience. Mm. Absolutely. We know that once the mind has calmed, we can drop into the truth of who we are, of what we are. We know that if we don't do this, we will remain in suffering. This is what well, the back, base... Back, yeah, we can remain, we can remain in uh, going back and forth from happiness and sadness. So you don't stay in a state of suffering, but... But the next sutras explain that. It says, Vritti Sarupya Mitaratra, Vritteya Panjataya Klishta Klishta. Klishta Aklishtaha means pain and not pain. Mm. So you actually go back and forth between pain and not pain, which is a form of suffering in itself. Yes. So where does the physical practice of yoga come into this whole process? And, and where is that leading to? Okay. So the second, the first chapter is written for those who can do the samadhi. He goes and he elaborates on for like another 45 sutras. 
Then the, the next chapter is called sadhana pada. Sadhana means one's practice or spiritual practice. And sadhana also means means. It also means means, like a means to an end, right? So the, the second chapter is a means to get to samadhi. So in other words, if you don't have the capacity for samadhi, then you go to the second chapter and do what's prescribed there. In the second chapter, he, taught, he breaks it into two types of yoga. Kriya yoga for the part-time yogi and ashtanga yoga for the full-time yogi. In the ashtanga section, he mentions asanas, the 46th verse. The 46th sutra, he says, uh, stira sukham asanam. That's the first time he mentions asanas, postures. The reason is because he talks about the gunas as well. Like, your mind is either in three states. It's fluctuating between these three states. You're either clear and calm, sattvic, or you're tamasic, which is sad, depressed, confused, or you're rajasic, greedy, fickle, angry, possessive. Yeah. And so, so you're, 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 either all, you're in either tamasic, rajasic, or a sattvic state. Now, if you understand these different states, then you know what prescription, which pill, the blue or the red pill to take. <laughs> or whatever orange pill to take, whether it's to, to help to reduce either the, the confusion or to reduce the greediness and increase the clarity. So if you have a teacher who's knowledgeable in this, they can prescribe the right things to help you get there quicker. The means, the, 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 the journey is shortened because you took the right steps. Right? So someone who, someone who is, a, so he prescribes asanas, he only has three sutras on asanas. The first one says, um, what are the parameters of asanas? Well, posture should be um, stable, stira, and it should be comfortable, sukham. That's it. He just says a posture should be stable and it should be comfortable. Then later, then the second sutra says how one should be how it should be practiced. It should be practiced with ease, prayatna. Actually, as a matter of fact, he says that uh, uh, most people interpret the word prayatna physical effort. Krishnamacharya actually, he says it's not physical effort. Prayatna comes from the word life effort. So it's actually breath effort, hmm. right? The effort of life is breath. So the breath should be made calm in your asana practice. So if you know that going in, then you're probably not going <laughs> <laughs> to bends or your muscle through your back bends and pinch a nerve and all this stuff. People do it all the time. And, um, you know, this should be the guiding philosophy when you practice. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the last sutra, on, uh, you know, uh, tells you that uh, by mastering the asanas or by, by having, uh, by practicing the asanas, one can become free of the dualities of life. In other words, they build tolerance. You, you build tolerance as a result of practicing your asanas. You tolerate people better. You can tolerate the fly or the mosquito that's on your arm. You can tolerate the road rage, right? You can tolerate the hot. You can tolerate the cold. So those, that's all he says about the, about the asanas. Um, but the reason you do the asanas isn't to get samadhi. You do the, reason, the reason you do the asanas is to prepare you to do the other things so you can get samadhi. Mm. It's just one step in eight. Mm. There are eight steps along the way. Ashtanga means eight steps. Or eight steps. The asanas is only the third step. Thank you. Um, Ricky, a little bit about my history in recovery. Um, I came from uh, a, a very tight body, very tight. And in recovery, <clears throat> well, in, in, in reaching out for drugs and alcohol, I, I really was trying to find sukham or ease. I was just trying to find ease, but I was looking in a place, maybe for me it was the wrong place. Because rather than creating ease in my life, it created more tightness, more stress, more tension. In my recovery, I put down drugs and alcohol, and I found that I still had tightness in my body. Just putting drugs and alcohol down was not a solution to my my tightness. Right. I found yoga and I began over the years to undo the tension pattern that had been created in my body. 
So I say that yoga brought me to a greater sense of ease. Do you feel for people who are recovering that yoga is a natural path, uh, a way to expand your spiritual connection and to unwind the tension patterns that we've set up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's a, there's a thing that I say in, in class um, that we hold our issues in our tissue. And um, absolutely. So, you know, uh, by releasing the issues in the tissue, we can start to change our patterns, the way we move, the way we hold our bodies. And in order for us to change the patterns in which we hold our bodies and move, we have to think about it, right? We have to think about putting our bodies in position that's not the same way every time. If you continue to do the same things over and over, you're going to continue to get the same things over and over. Mm -hmm. So the mind is intangible. It's hard to manipulate the mind, but we have this physical object here, which is our body, that we can, we can do something with. And it's a great starting place. It's a great starting place. It'll carry, you know, as long as we're alive, we have the body, we have the breath. Why, they're tools. Use them, you know, use them. Um, but yeah, I agree completely, 100%. Okay. Now, uh, with regards to your personal practice, do you, do you practice uh, physical postures every day? I used to. I used to, um, I used to practice postures every day. Um, on the days where I didn't have time to actually get on the mat and go to a class, you know, 30 minutes to class or whatever, and an hour and a half there, and it, you know, it takes a big tunk, tunk, chunk of time out of your life. Yes. On the days I don't have time to practice at the studio, I try to do it at home, mm. pull out my and do, you know, an hour, 30 minutes or whatever. If I, don't, if I don't have enough time to roll out my mat and do 30 minutes or whatever, I'll do a, a spontaneous yoga pose where I, wherever I am. And it doesn't have to be on the floor. Sometimes I'll just go up to the wall, put my hands on the wall, pull my hips back and open up my chest and my shoulders. Or um, I'll, you know, I'll find, if, if I don't have a wall and I have a pole to hold on to, mm. I'll do like a half moon and hold on to the pole. Yes. Or, or whatever. You know, time I was at, one time I was at the DMV getting my driver's license and it was a long line. I was bored. I did a headstand. I mean, um, yes, I, yoga postures became, oh, in my car, I'm sitting in traffic. I'm, oh, my back's hurting. I'm in traffic. My shoulders are rising. I'll raise my arms. I'll walk my hands back on the ceiling, take a back bend in my seat, or I'll, you know, take my arm over to the, to the seat over here and I'll lurk, turn to the left and stretch my chest. Of course, I can't get my left as, as much, yes. you know, or, I'll, or I'll grab my seat and I'll turn and twist. I remember when I first started doing yoga, I was in my uh, mid-20s, and I had gotten into some car accidents because I couldn't turn around and look behind me. In my mid-20s, I lost my mobility to turn. I, could, I couldn't do that. After a little bit of yoga, I realized, oh, I can actually look back and see behind me now. See, I can see where I'm going. That's how stiff I was. Yes. Very good. I, I really appreciate the idea that we can do yoga anywhere, anytime, and it doesn't have to be a 90-minute class. Right. Yes. So, um, do you, uh, you've, you've emphasized the importance of a teacher. Absolutely. At every step of the way in my recovery and in my yoga path, certainly the most progress I make is when I'm one-on-one -on -one with a teacher who's willing to work with me. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Um, well, I, I completely agree. There's a saying, Krishna, that knowledge without practice is futile. Right? So, like, if I, if I don't have a teacher and I'm just reading the books and, and trying to understand all this without any practice, it's not going to do anything. Likewise, on the other side of the coin, he says that practice without knowledge is blind. Like, there are people who are self-taught that can, that, you know, read a book or whatever and then learn these postures and then they can imitate what they see but it doesn't necessarily mean they're doing yoga. See, the real yoga is invisible. It's everything that the eyes cannot see. And if someone's not there to teach you that and you're just learning based on what you see, what are you doing? I mean, it, it, as far as uh, we know, it could be just like what, what my teacher says, that exercises that look like yoga. Hmm. So um, without the, having the knowledge or the guiding philosophy to, 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 to give you a goal or endpoint, then maybe you're not really doing the real yoga, which is fine. It's not a big deal. I didn't know what real yoga was, but you know, the more you learn, the more you want to know. That's te that tends to happen. They say that you're like a moth that's drawn to a flame. Once you get the, the taste of sweetness of yoga, 
that you're drawn to it like a moth is drawn to a flame and you're just going to want to know more. At that point, you probably want to get a teacher because the teacher, one, can, can show you all the pitfalls or the crocodiles, you know, you don't want to get snapped or taken under or lose yourself. And, you know, oftentimes doubt and, and fear come up in the yoga practice and it can push us the wrong way. And the, the teacher is there to, to help keep you on the path and, 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 and um, you know, give you shortcuts if possible. Mm -hmm. And when I say shortcuts, I mean like, you know, not, not like, okay, well, this is how you should do a handstand. But shortcuts like, hey, maybe that, what you're doing now, is not serving you. And if you did this, it might help you. For example, um, I was in Santa Barbara most recently. And these weren't my students. I was just teaching a workshop. And um, I overheard a, a student talk to a teacher about his suicidal thoughts. Mm. And, um, and, uh, and then they were going on and on. And I, I just, I was putting my stuff up and I was, you know, listening. Um, and uh, I wanted to say all these things. I'm like, that's not good advice, what you were saying. And, uh, but I didn't say anything. It was like, uh, he was talking about, okay, so he has suicidal thoughts. And it comes and goes. But... And then they were talking, he was talking about how he stays up late, he can't sleep, so he ends up watching movies, and the movies he chooses are movies with violence and death. <sighs> so having someone who's knowledgeable, that understands that what you put through the senses affect the mind, impressions and some scars, and then they come back through you know, unconscious thoughts and stuff like that. If the teacher, if, he, if someone doesn't come and, and which a couple days later I told the guy, I said, hey man, I don't know you very well, but I overheard your conversation the other day and I just want to give you some, 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 uh, some, some pointers if you're open to it. I don't want to you know, push this on you. So he was totally open. We had an hour to sat, sit down and talk. Mm. And, um, and I told him the reasons why. Because you're putting tamasic stuff in your mind. You're going to make your mind tamasic and you're going to have tamasic thoughts. Mm. You're not your mind. You can control your mind if you know what it's like. What you, you are what you eat. It's a, the mind's the same way. The mind is what it eats. If you feed it stuff that's going to give you thoughts of suicide and death and killing, then guess what? You're going to dream about suicide and death and killing. So um, I told him that, and I said, you need to start doing things that are uplifting. You need to start watching movies and, and listening to songs and reading books and surrounding yourself with people that are uplifting. That's an example. So you, you were somebody that at, at one point in your life, you would say that you were stuck in pretty bad addiction. And I think you're at a point now in your life where you would say you're not stuck in pretty bad addiction. How, how did that transformation come for you? Um, in, in stages. It came in stages. The... Um, so the reason that I was stuck in addiction um, is because the tendency for me to go too fast. I go too fast. And um, well, my mind goes too fast, if you will. Mm. And when we don't have stop signs in our mind, in our lives, we'll continue to do the same things based on reaction, reactivity. I noticed that in my yoga practice. Mm. So when, when I was able to change the way I practiced and change the way I thought during my practice, I was able to change the way I dis made decisions off the mat. So my, the first thing that happened was my yoga practice became more important than going out and getting drunk the, the night before. Right? So that's, that's the first thing that happened. I was like, oh man, I, I, I went out and I drank. I went to yoga class. And my balance was off and I felt weak and I couldn't understand what the teacher was saying because my mind was cloudy and I realized that so then I, I started cutting the alcohol out very powerful yeah so I, I, I didn't I wouldn't say I destroyed the habit or the addiction I replaced it with something better hmm. because I'm still going to continue thinking the way I think I my mind has an addictive cycle to it I just have to recognize it and put a stop sign in there Right, hmm. which is Chitta Brittini Roda, yes. stopping the mind. So then, um, and then, uh, then I started making better habits about my party life. Partied less and less and less, and practiced more and more and more. And then I started eating better, and then I started eating less and less and less and less, and practicing more. And then my body completely changed. 
the more the less junk I put in, and the more purification and detoxification I did, the more heat, right, trans transformation, the alchemy of the body and the mind. The more that happened, the more pure and, and clear I felt. And then one day, and I was still smoking cigarettes. And then one day, I, I this, so I quit, you know, I quit drinking and. and Along. So what happens, once I would drink, I would go and make other decisions to acquire or procure different things. And next thing you know, I'm a big mess. But, but so I stopped, I kind of nipped it at the bud, sort of, right, the alcohol. Then um, 12 months into the practice, I was walking out of class. I had a great practice. I walked out and I pulled out the pack of cigarettes and I'm like packing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd undo the cellophane and I pulled out the tab. I can remember it so clearly. I can smell it, and and that smell brought pleasure. I was like, this is this is pleasurable. I'm like, wow, because my senses were heightened after a yoga class, right? Hmm. So I was like, this this smells good. This is like so in my head, I'm noticing good, good, good. Why am I doing this? Because I think it's good. It's so good. I, I pull out the cigarette, you know, and I, I start to light it up, and and I'm like. Okay, this is not going to be good. So I remembered all the negative things with the cigarette. Mm. It was, I didn't like the way my hands smelled. I didn't like the way my mouth tasted. I didn't like the way my, my clothes would smell. I didn't like how when I would talk to people, I would stand back a little bit because I didn't want them to smell my breath. I was conscious about this. So then I was like, this is actually more painful than pleasurable. Um, and I had a, a moment of realization. Yes. I was like, okay, everything. Huh? You're, you're, you're frozen. Yes. Keep going. Okay. So I had a moment of realization. I'm like, okay, everything that we do in our lives is for one or two reasons and one or two reasons only. And it is pain or pleasure. And if I can link enough pain to any activity, I can quit doing it. And all of a sudden, that, at that moment, I was like, that I had this, my algorithms were going, my mental computer was going, and I was like, I don't like this, this brings more pain, I don't like this, this brings more pain. And I quit everything. That moment, revelation. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, of course, I started studying more and practicing, and meditating, and then just and, and making that a habit. You see, everything is a habit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, many people on the path of recovery, especially in 12-step recovery, um, don't know of the power of yoga. They're not aware that yoga can change the way that you think. It can give you a pause between a thought and an action. Yoga can create that, can give that to you. Can you speak a little bit about that um, for the people who maybe have never practiced yoga. See, my goal is if you're watching this video, you're so inspired by the possibility that yoga presents, you're on a mat tomorrow morning. I want everybody to, to everybody in recovery to get on the yoga mat and have an experience for themselves. So I want you to give them all a pep talk. Right. You know, there are things that we know, we know. Like I know that this, I'm wearing a green shirt. I know that I know how to dress myself. I know how to do certain things. I know how to make sunny side up eggs. I'm really good at that. There are things I know that I don't know. Like I don't know how to make a pizza from scratch. You know, I don't know how to weave this beanie from scratch. There are also things I don't know that I don't know. And it's hard to explain to someone things that they don't know that they don't know until they get a taste. It's like I can explain to someone how awesome it is to ride a bike. You can even do wheelies and bunny hops and stuff. But until someone gets on the bike, they're not going to realize how fun it could be to ride a bike. Likewise, the yoga practice is so wonderful and amazing. You just got to get out there and do it and get out and go. And, and if you're a new practitioner, don't get so caught up on having the best experience the first time around. Because you guess, guess what? You might not. And if you don't have that great experience, you won't come back. Look at it as, as sort of a dating process. And, you, and you're going to get some bad dates, you're going to get some good dates, but keep doing it for, commit to like at least a month. And take as many classes as you can. I challenge my students to do 10 classes the first 10 days or 25 classes the first month if they can. And then you can understand what it really feels like. 
And if, and if you feel much better in your body after doing a yoga class and deep breathing than you do smoking on a cigarette or drinking or doing whatever else that it is you're doing, then you're going to be able to drop those habits a whole lot easier. And there's only one way to find out. Like I said, practice without knowledge is blind and knowledge without practice is futile. We can talk about it all we want, but it's just futile. You've got to go out there and just do it. And guess what? The worst thing that can happen is you've lost an hour of your life and you feel a little better. The best thing that can happen is it can change your life for the best. Mm. And it's a gamble I think that you should take. Mm. And I know all you guys out there are gamblers because you're taking risks day and day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ricky. Um, how can people uh, train with you, find a workshop, or uh, connect with you on the web? Where's the place to go? The best place to go um, would be really tranyoga.com. Um, sometimes the site's not updated, but you can also follow me on social media. Um, I'm not posting a whole lot, but I think this year uh, I'm going to start posting a little more on my Instagram account. Um, Ricky Tran Yoga on Instagram, um, Ricky Tran Yoga on Facebook. Um, but I'm gonna, but I think I'm going to go more onto the Instagram, do the Instagram thing, and um, I'm, my my Facebook is becoming more of a private uh, thing. I'm, I'm having a baby in April, so so find me on Instagram. Thank you. Find me on Instagram, um, rickytranyoga.com. I'm in Dallas, Texas. My traveling, I'm going to travel less and less uh, and, until the baby's, you know, maybe walking or whatever, and then I'll travel a little more. But mm -hmm. I'm still going to be traveling maybe two or three times a year. I'm in L.A. at least twice a year for the teacher training program at LMU. Um, but, yeah, rickytranyoga.com and social media, rickytranyoga. Thank you so much, Ricky. And I, I hope to uh, get a chance to be in one of your classes this year if possible. Thank you very much. All right. Be well. Take care. Namaste. Namaste.